everyone, and welcome back to another episode of What to Stream. My name is Morgan, and I am one of the hosts here on this fabulous uh, web series. And I am joined by Lupe, our other host. Um, Lupe, before we start, can you tell uh, the fine people out there a little bit about your outlet and yeah, what your web, what, what your website is about? Well, I'm a Hollywood Critics Association member, and I run Cinemovie. That's my own uh, website. So cinemovie.tv, we cover reviews and uh, interviews. And so some of the movies I'll be, and series I'll be talking about today, there you can find some interviews on YouTube as well. And yourself? Sweet. Yeah, so I um, am the founder and editor-in-chief of Cinemacy, which is a website dedicated to independent film. So we cover pretty much... It independent film exclusively. So that's kind of our corner of the large film market. That's our good balance. That's what I like about yeah. us. That you do the indie stuff and I do the, the you know the major stuff, sometimes indie stuff. So it's like a, it's a mixed bag. So yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And especially I think this episode, there's a couple things you're going to be talking about that I haven't seen yet that I'm very excited to um, to hear about. And yeah, you were saying that you sense kind of a theme before we jump you in. sense a theme with your options, yeah. with your... <laughs> <laughs> you caught me. Yeah. <laughs> so as we record this, it is Wednesday, but tomorrow is Thursday and that is Earth Day. And so the theme of the movies that I picked this week are all centered around Earth Day and, and climate um, focused. And so the first film that I'm going to talk about is a short documentary that is on Apple TV Plus, and that is called The Year Earth Changed. And this documentary is really great. It's very digestible at about 40 minutes long. I kind of like these little quick hit films um, because you can watch them in one sitting if you are short on time, but you really wanna watch something engaging and timely and really important and highly recommend the year Earth changed. This is directed by Tom Beard. And this film is so fascinating because the entire premise takes a positive spin on the whole stay at home orders of the pandemic. Um, so all of 2020, for the most part, we were stuck at home, working from home, baking bread, watching Tiger King, like doing all of these things from our houses. And while we were probably growing frustrated with just being in such close quarters all of the time for weeks and then months on end. This film shows the benefits that it had on the animals and on the planet and in nature. And some of the facts are very astonishing. Like LA had the best air quality this past year than it had in the last 40 years which is I mean, like if we were just to stay home and you know, this is kind of proven in the film, but if the point is if we were to stay home a few days of, of, out of the year and just kind of take a break and not be putting out so much like car traffic and pollution and just kind of keeping more centered to our own houses, the animals will thrive. And the film takes a look at this through all parts of the world and all these different countries and how so many animals benefited from humans staying home, from sea turtles that could now migrate from being born on the beaches into the ocean without human interference. There were whales and other sea creatures that were able to effectively communicate with their young in the ocean without the disruption of giant cruise ships. It's really fascinating, um, this film, yeah, is is streaming on Apple TV Plus and the perfect film, I think, to watch in honor of Earth Day. So I highly recommend that one if you are interested in saving the planet. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted. Oops, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing how the Earth recovered in such little time that humans stayed home. It was yeah. I mean, it really tells you a lot about climate change and how the humans are really affecting it. Yeah, and just how the animals can adapt. Like some animals were used to humans feeding them. Mm -hmm. And so while humans were gone, they didn't starve. They figured out, oh, back in the, the day, my ancestors weren't being fed by hand from humans. I have to go scavenge the forest. And so 
these animals, like their instincts just kicked in and they knew what to do. And it's really, really cool to see. Yeah, I've taught my, my dog bad habits since I've been home. He, <laughs> he, wants, he wants human food only now. He doesn't want kibbles. Even if I buy him like the good dog food, he's like, nope, I want human yeah. food. It's above it now. Bad, bad, <laughs> bad human. <laughs> oh, we're all guilty. I do that too with mine, so. Yeah. I can't judge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like a good one. Another one I want to watch because I'm a big fan of uh, these nature dogs, especially how things have changed because of the pandemic. So I'm mm -hmm. going to check that out. Awesome. All right. So mine is a little more on the surface, purely entertainment, but they are saving the earth somehow <laughs> in a fictional manner. So today I'm talking about Mortal Kombat. If you live under a rock, it is an adaptation of the video game, which has been around a few decades now. There was a movie back in the 90s. Um, and I think by all accounts, it was, it was just okay. But here now we have a 2.0 Mortal Kombat movie. And the stakes are a lot higher. There's a lot of special effects that are really cool. And the, the plot uh, follows MMA fighter, Cole Young, who we see here, um, played by Louis Tan. He's unaware that he has some very important heritage. He's the son of Hanzo Hasashi, who we know as fans know as the Scorpion. And one day when he's fighting, uh, Sub-Zero, who's a fan favorite, um, shows up and he's trying to kill his family. So uh, another um, warrior, shows up and his name is Jax. And he also bears the birthmark of a dragon marking, um, which uh, Cole has no idea. He, he thinks it's a birthmark. Um, and so Jax tries to explain to him that he's part of this legacy and he's not really believing it until Sub-Zero shows up and he's trying to kill his whole family. So Sub-Zero helps him escape. Here you have uh, Sub-Zero and Jax facing off. And so basically he's told to go seek out uh, Sonya Blade. She's another popular character from the video game uh, played here by Jessica McNamee. And she fills him in on the whole, uh, basically what's going on. There's villains from another world called the Outer Worlds run by Emperor Shang Tsung. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it's a high stakes battle for Earth against these other world villains. So basically they're gathering all these warriors who have this dragon marking because they're the ones that can really uh, stand up to the villains in this movie. And so in the movie, we have Lord Raiden, Liu Kang, Kang Lao, Kano, who is a favorite of a lot of people. Let me see, here we'll see um, Kano, there's Kano. And then we also have, here's the, the villain, the emperor. And so you see some of the, uh, favorite characters from the video game, but you won't see all of them. We interviewed the director and producer and they said they had to pick and choose because obviously this is a franchise. They're gonna to wanna to extend it. And so they picked only a few characters and especially like a character like Kano, who's kind of a smart ass. They have a couple of them, I guess, in the video game. So they just chose one, one of them um, to be in this movie. And the plot is really simplistic. You don't have to be a Mortal Kombat gamer to understand it. It's really simple. Basically, you have to save Earth against this menace. And so for non-gamers, there's no problem in following the, um, the action and, and the storyline. So that's, that's a good thing, because I'm, 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 I'm not a gamer. So it was pretty easy. I mean, it's pretty basic. Um, this movie is directed by, it's a first time director, which I was shocked. Um, because it's a lot, a lot of special effects, but he's a commercial director. And when I kind of find his name, um, Simon McCoy, I believe. Yeah, McCoy, and he was a commercial director. So it's uh, surprising that, that they brought him on, but he actually does a really good job. The special effects are really, really top notch. Um, if you're not uh, familiar with the stories, these uh, warriors, they have superpowers, some of them. Some of them are just mere mortals. But like you're seeing here, Scorpion, he's got special powers and Sub-Zero who turns things into ice. And it's really, really flawless. I really liked the um, CGI. And I mean, there's this one scene here where you see that was CGI took me a little bit out of the movie. It looked a little, um, a little fake, but that was pretty much the only scene that took me out of the movie. But otherwise it's really, really great um, special effects. The blood work, you'll see a lot of blood. I think the gamers will love it because they love seeing blood. 
Um, and they did something really cool. They, the director and producer talked about how they used actual blood. It was practical effects on the set. So you have these really nice martial arts moves. Um, and on top of that, you have these special effects, but they're seamless. So they look really, really cool. And I think gamers will be happy um, to see that. And it is bloody, but it looks like fake. It's sort of look fake looking, not in terms of like it's fake blood, but um, it's not gory is what I mean to say. I mean, there's some gory parts, but not as, it's, not, it's not too bad. I mean, here you see um, a little bit of blood, but it's not too bad. But I think on the violence level, there's a lot of fight scenes. There's a lot of martial arts, which I'm sure people will enjoy. And it's beautifully choreo choreographed. They're kind of like dances. Um, and then you have um, Kano and Sonya. Now their fights are brutal. And it's really a good contrast to the other characters because they, they go mano a mano um, combat. And like I mentioned, Kano's sort of a smart ass. So he was probably my one of my favorite characters because he's such a smart ass. Um, and Sonya too, she really held her own. Um, actor, actress Jessica McNamee and Josh um, shoot, Lawson. Those two uh, stole the show because I thought they were just so much fun. And they had this really, really brutal fight scene in a really small cramped area. It's like a trailer home. And it sort of reminded me of the same kind of fight we see in Kill Bill um, in the trailer with um, Daryl Hannah and um, I cannot believe her real name, the bride, <laughs> Uma Thurman, Uma Thurman. So if you remember that fight, that fight was really brutal. They would use anything that they could find, toilet seats and whatever you can find in there. That's what the, the fight reminded me of. And their characters were just so much fun. Um, the other characters, I mean, they were okay. Louis Tan, unfortunately, um, as Cole Young, he was a little bland. I mean, he was interesting. You're invested in all the characters. But I think the standouts were really Sonya Blade and Kano. So I think the actors really brought, um, brought their A game with these characters. And what I really liked um, was Jessica McLaughlin and the way she plays Sonya Blade. There was some vulnerability because you know when they bring you these kick ass ladies, especially from video games, they're just like mean mugging for the camera. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm tough, but she had this very uh, great vulnerability and you really were rooting for her because she doesn't have the dragon marking. So she's told like, you're not part of this group. Um, so, and she brought that vulnerability to, to the character, which I really, really like, cause I expected, cause when you see the graphics of Sonya Blade from the video game, she looks like this tough chick that's just me mugging the camera. Mm -hmm. But so I think they brought, um, Jessica McNamee, McNamee brought a real range to the character and you're really invested in her journey to be part of the group, even though she's told you don't have the marking, you're not as special, but she can fight. So um, yeah, like I said, I think gamers and non-gamers will enjoy it. I mean, I can't speak for gamers, but um, I thought, you know, if these are fav fan favorites, then this might work here um, as well. So I'd be, I'm anxious to hear from gamers what they thought of this movie, but, um, oh, and it's available yeah. on HBO Max. Yeah, it's available on HBO Max. So I saw it on the small, small screen. Not small, I have a 65 inch, but it looked pretty good. I don't know what it's to look like in, in a big screen. Um, so you have both options. You can see it at a big screen or you can watch it on HBO Max. I would say if you're not a gamer, you're not that invested, I would stick to watching it on HBO Max. But if you're a fan, obviously you have to see it on the big screen and judge it um, that way. But I mean, I enjoyed it. It's not great, but I think I enjoyed it. And the most, the thing what I liked the most about it was how good the CGI looked. There's this one, blood sword that goes through one character and comes out the other. And I was like, that was so cool. Like I rewinded to, I was like, how do you do that? They do that because they said it was practical effects, but I mean, they can't be practical effects because it goes through somebody's body. So it's a probably like a combination of CGI, but yeah, I mean, I was really surprised at this director, what this director pulled off because like I mentioned, this is his first feature film. He's a commercial director, but I think that's why they chose him because he had um, experience with those kind of like, uh, special effects and, and practical stuff. So yeah, commercial directors are very um, sharp and like they know mm -hmm. what to do and how to just and because they've had so much practice like in co the commercial world kind of fine tuning all these crazy ideas and things. Yeah. And so it's cool that it translated though. That's no, it that's did. I mean, I was know. really shocked at how good it looked. So I'm um, hopefully on the big screen it looks just as good, but on, on TV uh, version, I thought it looked it looked pretty good. And like I said, it was one that one scene that took me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. because it didn't look natural, but that was it. But I mean, it looked video game me. So it's right. in, in context of video games, it looks like that world, but just judging it like on a, as a regular movie, 
that part kind of took me out because of the character. But it's understandable. That character has to be CGI because it's got four arms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that'd be a very hard casting process if it wasn't yes. CGI. <laughs> yeah. so. Nice. Cool. Well, I have another film that you may have missed. And this is another kind of Earth Day centered documentary. And this is the film I Am Greta, which is streaming now on Hulu and directed by Nathan Grossman. I have to say off the bat, this is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. It's great. Um, so if you are one of those people that checks Rotten Tomatoes before you invest in watching a movie, I have done the work for you. It is certified fresh. You should watch it. Um, basically, the story details the daily life of the young activist Greta Thunberg, who is a 15-year-old student in Sweden. Um, she started school uh, and then left because she was so invested with the climate and climate change and just the repercussions of what humans can do to the earth and just how we're kind of going in this downward spiral of destruction in a way. Um, so she poses a question in the film to all of the adults in her life. I will say, by the way, she is supported by her parents. They are very supportive of her not being in school, of her um, going on strike in support of climate and to draw attention to her cause. But to all the other adults who judge her or who don't take her seriously, she asks the question, um, if you don't care about my future, why should I care about my future in school? Because if I go to school and work hard, what's the point if the future just will cease to exist because we're gonna have massive climate destruction and, and nothing will be normal. So that's kind of, that was her initial catalyst for skipping school and starting a climate change strike. And within months, this picked up traction through social media and through her being so invested in connecting with so many other like-minded people. And it evolved into this global movement that brought her fame and notoriety, uh, which was a lot for her because she also admits in the film, which I didn't know prior to seeing it, that she is on the autism spectrum and she has Asperger's. And that actually is to her benefit because it makes her laser focused on certain things. And the thing that she is laser focused on now is climate change. And so it's really fascinating to see how Greta, who doesn't fly by plane, she will only use a boat. And that kind of gets a little bit choppy, no pun intended, when she, has to travel from Sweden to New York for a UN, a UN climate uh, talk and she doesn't fly. So she takes a boat with her dad and it lasts days or even weeks. And it's a lot for her, but she's committed to the cause. And it's a really fascinating story about not even just the climate and you know the repercussions that can happen when we don't take it seriously, climate change, but it's she is just an incredible young woman. I mean, she's, I think, 16 or seven, maybe 16 now. This was filmed when she was 15. And yeah, I mean, it's mind blowing. Just her dedication, her passion, her wisdom beyond her years is very, very inspiring. And so if you haven't seen I Am Greta, yes, it's streaming on Hulu and perfect to watch for this week as well. I love her. She makes me feel like such a loser. <laughs> right? I'm like, are you tired? Like, how do you, you do so much and you're 15. How? <laughs> it's the rest of us, us adults to shame. We yeah. did nothing like that of the story. Well, some people did, but I mean, at 15, we were thinking about boys. <laughs> yeah, I know. I the Climate change was, I think, the furthest thing from my mind. So that's why it's so cool to see kids that are very involved at a very young age. Yeah, I saw today on the news, they were talking to this 11-year-old who started his own recycling company. Oh, and wow. People were sending him so much money that he started this nonprofit. And so he funds projects now around the world. And it's like, oh, my God, I'm such wow. a loser. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be doing something. Yeah. All these young kids, you know, it's like, Let's I think counts, it's great. Right? We're kind of raising we're awareness of good yeah. films. <laughs> That's what we're aiming. Yeah. 
And speaking of, small part. yeah, I take it to the oceans with uh, a new Disney Plus series from National Geographic called Secrets of the Whales. And it is absolutely gorgeous. It's airing on Earth Day on Disney Plus. It's called Secret of the Whales. And it's produced by James Cameron and a great narrator, her voice, uh, voiced by Sigourney Weaver, who doesn't love Sigourney Weaver. And basically this four part uh, series takes you around the world studying whale behavior and their social structures. And Brian Scarry, who's a National Geographic explorer and photographer, he swims with these whales. I'm amazed he's got that much cojones to get in the water, especially with these orcas, AKA killer whales. And he does so with all the uh, whales that he um, explores in this beautiful, beautiful documentary. Um, they cover hemp humpbacks, orcas, belugas, um, and sperm whales. And it's a three-year adventure. He went uh, to study them in their backyard, basically. And what we learn is that uh, these um, mammals, they basically operate um, through a matriarchy. The matriarch teaches them everything, the grandmother. Um, it's, if you've watched the do elephant documentaries, it's pretty much the same kind of structure. And it's just beautiful to watch. Of course, my favorite, are these little belugas who are just so freaking adorable. I love these. I mean, look at that picture, just gorgeous. And the pictures that they get underwater are just fantastic. And you're in awe, not only of these mammals, but you're on awe at how, um, technically how they can capture such vibrant pictures um, underwater and above the sea. And it's just amazing um, what you learn following these whale pods around the world um, and especially the clarity and the sound, uh, the director I spoke to, not director, but Brian Scary, I spoke to him and they used a hydrophone to capture um, a lot of the sound that the whales make and they each have their language. And so you hear how they speak to each other. And it's just amazing that they all have, you know, this social structure. You don't really think about it um, much, I guess, when you're on the ground like we are. And it's just so beautiful to watch. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it, especially for Earth Day, especially for the whole family. Um, and yeah, don't, don't miss it. It's pretty remarkable. I think your kids will love it. Um, adults will love it because you learn, you learn so much and you gain a really new respect for these creatures who are like us, basically. And that was the point of this documentary is to show how whales have this really complex structure um, that reminds you of us, essentially, how we operate. So it, it was just so beautiful to watch. I remember when I watched the elephant documentary and, and found out how their social structure works, I was just in awe of elephants. And then same reaction here, watching the whales, how they operate. I mean, they're so intelligent. And um, I mean, it's just a beautiful, I mean, I couldn't stop watching, even though I was having internet problems. <laughs> <laughs> watch it online. I'm going to rewatch it again just because, I mean, the beauty of it is just so beautiful. And you realize, uh, just like in the elephant uh, world, or any mammal, like the males just come in and pregnate and leave. And the, the matriarchs are the ones that are in charge of teaching the young how to feed, how to mate, pretty much everything. You just gain a whole new respect for these creatures. I'm just so in love with these creatures, mm -hmm. even more so um, after you watch this, because it's just, it's just beautiful. And, you know, of course, our the ocean um, is in danger as well. Um, and they don't touch upon too much about that. It's mostly about the society, societal structure um, that these mammals have. Um, and so you just gain a new respect for, for, these, hmm. for these big guys. So it's beautiful. I recommend is it, it every month. Um, one doc or is it like a series? No, it's four, four parts. parts. Four parts, okay. Four parts. So each one focuses on a certain species of whales. But there's like hundreds of species right. of whales. So why they chose these, I guess, is because they were able to capture them in the wild, mm. basically. So that's how they how, how they found pods, and then they decided, okay. And I'm, you know, probably the people who the ones that accepted humans next to them. And oh, there's one I want to talk about. There's one scene where an orca offers one of the manta rays to Brian in the water, like, hey. Because they eat, I think in, in Australia, they eat um, 
I forgot what part of the world they eat uh, manta rays instead of seals. Oh, so wow. Okay. He had a manta, one of them had a manta ray. I think it was a, a female had a manta ray in her mouth and she put it right in front of him on the ocean floor. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. And she was like, Oh, you're not gonna eat that? Okay, then never mind. <laughs> that was being nice. Come on. Yeah, so it's such a really beautiful documentary. I just I'm so in love with whales now. Mm. I want to jump in the water with them, but Yeah, that might be a little on screen is fine. Or I have, a hard, have you seen those videos where the uh, people are paddling in the ocean and the whale comes next to them and they're like so scared and, and then it's it leads to like exhilaration, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm next to a whale. But at yeah. first you're like freaking scared because like, oh my yeah, God, these things are gonna eat me. Swallowed whole or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so cool. I I had heard about that, but I hadn't seen it yet, so. Yeah, I mean, beautiful cinematography. So it's just so clear. Because you know, when you have murky water, you can't see what's really going on, but these cameras were up close to mm. them, like super close. I mean, you saw that one photo I showed here. He's with the orcas. Wow. I mean, they're called killer killer uh killer whales for a reason mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but he said you know if you're not if you don't threaten them if they don't feel threatened then they're not going to you know mm -hmm. um, attack i mean they don't in nature they don't i mean we've heard you know stories of you know what happens to sea world trainers but, right um, he says in the wild it's a rare it's a rare occurrence right so that's why that's, I see that's my earth no day recommendation <laughs> nice yeah i love that i'll have to check that out yeah Cool. Well, my last recommendation is, you guessed it, another <laughs> Earth Day centered documentary called David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. And I think I actually failed to mention that the first film I talked about earlier, The Year Earth Changed, was also narrated by David Attenborough, who is known for narrating all of the best nature documentaries on the BBC. And this is no different. Um, this one is now streaming on Netflix. And this man is so incredible. He is kind of the same, but different as Greta Thunberg, who we just talked about. He is 93, probably 94 now, um, but completely dedicated his whole entire life to animal conservation and animal awareness. And he claims that this film a Life on Our Planet is his witness statement and his vision for the future. So basically, this um, documentary tells the story of life on our planet, and it comes from David Attenborough and his firsthand account of when he was younger and first getting into studying wildlife. And it's so interesting to see him as like a younger man in the jungle and in the rainforests and in the ocean just being so clearly passionate about this from day one. Um, he's witnessed and visited every continent on the globe. And he's done this in 90 years, which is pretty amazing. Um, so he's seen and he's documented all of these different ecosystems. And he's seen how the living world all works together in the most beautiful of ways. But also he sees human destruction and how that can be really devastating to all of these ecosystems. And so in the film, he addresses some of the biggest challenges that life as we know it will face on our planet. Um, but the film is actually a hopeful message. He, because of his experience, he gives a lot of really great advice on how we can stop climate change today if we were all dedicated to just doing a couple small lifestyle changes we could make the biggest difference for the environment and for the animals and for the ecosystem that would last for years and years and years to come so yeah i mean if you love the sound of david attenborough's voice i highly recommend this documentary that's what drew me to it and any film that he narrates is just i will watch it no matter what um, it is very inspiring. It's all, it's hard to watch just because you do see some of the, I don't know, the, the things that are frustrating, knowing that we as human beings have caused some of these disasters or some of these seemingly irreversible situations that we have forced animals into. But it is really good um, that he offers some solutions and some ways out of the hole that we've kind of dug ourselves into. 
So that I highly recommend David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. And that is streaming on Netflix. He's like the epitome of nature docs, right? Oh yeah. You just hear that voice. You know, like you can close your eyes if you just start to hear him talk. You're like, oh, that's a BBC nature documentary. <laughs> Well, as soon as you, so you said uh, his name, I was like, I heard his voice in my head. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> I would imitate it, but I can't. <laughs> I know I was going to, because people have imitated him, right? He's like uh, yeah. the go-to they, uh, parody. Yes. <laughs> They've tried, but he's just so unique and so in a class of his own that, I mean, he's 90 plus years old, and that's pretty amazing that he's still working and he's still going out as much as he can. And you know, being an advocate for the animals who don't have a voice. And it, he's just the most inspiring man. So it's a good one. And it's on Netflix. Easy and to watch. it's on Netflix. Exactly. Yep. All right. I'm putting that one on my list too. Nice. In honor of Earth Day. All right. Well, my next pick, not related to Earth, but it is social it commentary. <laughs> so, you know, we've had some, a lot of tragedies uh, this year so far, um, just recently the killing of Duante Wright, um, the female officer who accidentally, um, she says, used, she thought she was um, using her taser and said she used her gun and killed uh, Duante Wright. Duante, right? And that actually reminded me of the Fruitville Station movie, which was actually based on a similar incident um, back in 2008 on New Year's Eve. And they made a movie about it. It uh, stars Michael B. Jordan, Melanie De Diaz, Kevin Durant, and Octavia Spencer. It's directed by Ryan Coogler. And this movie basically um, is what propelled Michael Jordan, B. Jordan, and Ryan Coogler into Hollywood um, notoriety. Uh, as we know, and Ryan Coogler went on to do Black Panther and Creed, and Michael B. Jordan is just a huge star now. But the story is about Oscar Grant. Like I mentioned, he was killed on New Year's Eve 2008 at the Oakland BART station. Uh, the officer mistook his gun for a taser, so the story goes. He was 22 years old. Um, he had a young daughter. And it's just a, I mean, as a movie, it's a really, really good movie. It's just a day in the life leading up to this event. And Michael B. Jordan, you can see why he became um, a star and high in demand because he's just so, so really, really, really good. And um, you know, it's a tough move. Well, it's an easy movie to watch until the end, obviously, because we know how it ends. Um, but it's a really, really good movie and it really humanizes this um, person, Oscar Grant, and it doesn't sugarcoat anything. They, they reveal he had a couple of run-ins with the law. So, um, but they humanizes him. And I think that's really important, important uh, when we're talking about these stories. And this movie came out, Fruitville Station, 2013. Uh, it is now, you can see it on Netflix or rent it on Amazon and Vudu. I think it's only $3.99 right now. Uh, but yeah, it's on Netflix for free if you're a subscriber. And the ending will get you. It killed me at the end. Oct Octavia Spencer's performance in the end was just really, really heart-wrenching. And I was bawling um, just because you see the reaction of a mother, um, which is not, you know, really focused when they're, focusing on a certain subject, but her performance was just, I can't believe they didn't nominate her uh, for that. Um, so check that out um, if you want to um, uh, just, you know, watch Michael B. Jordan's debut as a lead actor. Um, but I highly, highly recommend it. Um, like I mentioned, it's a really good film. Um, it's a hard watch at the end, but I mean, you just, it's good filmmaking and it's, um, sadly, history repeating itself again. Uh, so that's kind of my <laughs> downer for the for the day. But it's a really good movie. Aside from you know the tragedy that it is, it's a really really good movie. It's really well done. Ryan Coogler's first real breakthrough in Hollywood, and you can see why because it's just done so so really well. Um, and there's no judgment in it. It's just a story told of this guy living his life, and you know, and it ends in yeah. a tragedy. So I highly recommend it. I saw this when it came out. I remember it because I was it was one of the first interviews I had ever done for Cinemacy, actually. And it was at oh. LA Film Festival. And I'll never forget because I now I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually talked to Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan back in the day. Like, whoa. <laughs> but yeah, that movie is very I haven't seen it since then. So it's been 
to eight years, I guess, since I've seen it, but it's a tough watch. But mm-hmm. like you said, that performances are incredible and you, you, there's no surprise why they both just kind of skyrocketed. Yeah. After. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because you say that because I also interviewed them um, when the movie came out. Oh, funny. And, and it was funny because when I sat down with him and he was speaking so eloquently, I was like, this guy's going to, he's going to go places. Yeah. Because, you know, you can tell. performance. And he was just so um, eloquent about what he was talking about and making just important points about the movie and why it was made. And, you know, not just, not from an artistic side, but just like he was serious about like, we need to change things. And, you know, so you're like, oh, talented and also aware. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he's just not sugarcoating like, yeah, it's a great performance. But, you know, he knew he knew the uh, gravity of depicting um, this 22 year old. Right. So, yeah. Oh, so, like I said, it's a tough one. watch, but it's a, it's a good one. And uh, I think that incident actually sparked the change in tasers because before they were same color as a gun. Oh, I believe. interesting. I think that's part conversation of like, okay, now we have to change the color of a taser because I don't know if that was the only incident, but I'm mm-hmm. sure there have been other incidents where they mistook one thing for the other. So that's why they're a little yeah. more strict. They're like, you have to wear one on one side and the other on the other right. side, the less dominant You're side of the dumb. taser. Yeah. Interesting. So, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Con- real life consequences. <sighs> yeah. In today. So exactly. Well, on that note, <laughs> on that note, we can do some choices here. <laughs> we have different choices. Yeah. So happy early Earth Day. Um, happy Earth Day by the time you are watching this all at home. And yeah, if there's any films or or if you know of any more David Attenborough documentaries you think we should watch or any Earth Day films that we've missed, leave them in the comments below because we would love to check them out. Um, Thank you so much for watching and we will see you next week. Thanks for joining. Follow us on Twitter here. Here's our uh, handles. Yes. Right there. All right. See you next week, Morgan. (laughs) See everybody out there. Bye. Bye. Bye.